This video is brought to you by Law Excellence IAS Academy. Dear students, good morning. Welcome to Deep Daily Editorial Enrichment Program of Law XRND. Let us start the discussion on today's newspaper that is 24th July 2019. The first article for discussion, A Bridge Across the Indian-Pakistan Abyss. You know that India-Pakistan relations, they reached the lowest point in the last four years. The major reason is cross-border terrorism and it is reflected everywhere. So the regional organizations like SARC, they became non-functional and also cross-border trade also has come to a halt stating that drug trafficking and arms trade is going on through this cross-border trade. So in this context, irrespective of all these happening, one thing that is moving forward, this is called Kartarpur Corridor. So Kartarpur Corridor has become an exception to the Indian policy. It means faith over the policy. This is a critical example to it. It is to connect two strains which are important to the six across the border. So in this case, Dera Baba Nanka town in Punjab to the Gurdwara Darbar Sahib Kartarpur. These two are being connected by a corridor. Initially, India had certain apprehensions. The first apprehension was, is this going to give a new Philip to Khalistan movement? Are Khalistan terrorists, are extremists are going to take any advantage of this situation to get the international attention? You know that referendum 2020 is already announced by these people, where they are demanding to conduct a worldwide referendum across all the six to demand for a Sikh state. And the second is, can this become a source of cross-border terrorism that was the second fear for India? And the next is, drugs and arms movement across this corridor. But however, both the countries were able to sit at the zero point at Waga border and without public glare and media frenzy, they are able to solve the problems. This can be a guide for future talks and negotiations between India and Pakistan. So because of the huge emotional aspect associated with this, election rhetoric associated with this, more the relations are being pulled back rather than moving forward. So the Kartarpur spirit has to take forward the India-Pakistan relations. That's what is the wish of the author over here. The next, what suits Trump? Trump has brought in a new normal in diplomatic relations when he has announced that Prime Minister Modi has asked him to mediate on Kashmir issue. You know that the 1972 Shimla Agreement, Lahore Declaration of Vajpayee in 1999, both of them have clearly stated that India inclined to settle all the pending disputes with Pakistan only bilaterally. And the second is... Probably it can be a misunderstanding. When Pakistan was involved with uh, cross-border terrorism, India has clearly stated to the world nations that um, they have to rein in Pakistan. Especially after Pulwama attack, uh, India was very critical and uh, the Balakot and a strike against the Pakistan, everything. At that point of time also Mr. Trump declared that he has involved between India and Pakistan to solve the issue. So this kind of uh, a talk where diplomatic protocols have been set aside, the private talk between two leaders has been publicly announced, is a new normal of Trump in diplomatic relations. This kind of open talk shall be avoided for a good diplomatic relations between these two countries. But most worrisome is Mr. Trump want to pull American forces away from Afghanistan. In this case, he is looking for the help of the Pakistan. So in this context, the talks with the Taliban is, medi is getting mediated by the Pakistan now. So the Trump's pulling out of forces from Afghanistan can push him to negotiate peace with Pakistan or ignore the terror facts of the Pakistan. So that's why India need to maintain its strategic autonomy with diplomatic relations, which I always stated, even now I would like to state. India shall maintain its strategic autonomy, especially like with countries like USA. Giving ties with Seoul a facelift. So India, South Korea, stable democracies and both believe in liberal economic order. In this context, 
the economic relationship between india and south korea is expected to take a boost so they have comprehensive economic partnership agreement under this both the countries wants to boost the trade by 50 billion dollars by 2030 are we in this direction let us analyze this you know that automobile spare parts electronics telecommunication equipment these are the major imports for india from seoul on the other hand india is exporting mineral fuels oil distillates and cereals iron and steel from these are the exports to seoul so here there are few positive things that we can look at so the korea is the largest trading partner was china in this scenario us china relations as they got strained as the trade war broke between them korean companies are looking for alternative country which has got more stable economy so india is the best solution for them as it has the largest market after china and also the cheap labor but however lack of strong public people to people relations cultural relations chamber of commerce is a major drawback drawback over here and the second is the co production of thunder hot widger in india under make in india is a positive sign in defense relations india korea science and technology center is established at bengaluru so india has activist policy similarly south korea has new southern policy both of them can synergize with each other so the indian relations with korea can lead to deepening of the economic trade between these countries and the next part is making the water guzzling thermal plants accountable what is meant by water accounting you know that india is a water stressed country today at every level in every production india has to count how much of the water it is u- using so let me put this way around 3600 liters of water is used to produce a kg of rice in india when we are exporting a kg of rice we have to think that we are also exporting more than 3500 liters of water so water accounting has to be brought into india in this context thermal power plants in india these are water guzzlers they use huge amounts of water so there has to be a water accounting how much is consumed by these thermal power plants that is what essence of this article they also state that environmental protection laws have to be linked this and penalties have to be provided on these plants so that some discipline sets in the next the complexities complexities of naga identity you know that when prime minister modi came to power immediately an agreement was signed between government of india and the nagas that is nsc and im this is what is called framework agreement and the outcomes of it the contents of it are not made outside they are not revealed to the public remember that nsc and im their first demand is uh, that is sovereignty if that is not possible they want to have greater nagalim so greater nagalim means all the naga inhabited regions uh, shall be under the nagaland state so this is the demand of nsc and im you know that nsc and im demands a separate naga identity outside the indian constitution it means um, they are not want to do not want to bound by the sovereignty of indian constitution but indian government clearly want the solution to be within the framework of the indian constitution so in this case recently nagaland has announced for a register of indigenous inhabitants of nagaland this register will not have any impact on the indian citizenship so this is meant to distinguish who are the indigenous inhabitants and who are the outsiders it means certain criteria are been framed if any naga follows that criteria he will be called as an indigenous inhabitant and who do not follow this he will not be called as so so in this context the nsc and im it believes that it is going to divide the nagas so the nagas of manipur assam arunachal pradesh they will not claim the indigenous inhabitants status as they are in the outside states and the nsc and im has clearly objected to this what is the criteria stated december 1 1963 is the cut off any permanent resident before the date in nagaland or 
any parents are legitimate guardians who are paying house tax before the date or who possesses legitimate property or who who has acquired property or patta land before that particular date in the state of nagaland he will be recognized as indigenous inhabitant here another issue which is connected to is inner line permit it means any person who wants to cross this inner line permit who is not an indigenous inhabitant shall take the permission of the nagaland government this will be issued for 30 days now non indigenous inhabitants who are living in the districts such as dimapur all these are expected to take this ilp permission to conduct any trade in the dimapur now so in this context there is clear difference in the stand between nsc and im and the rin that is register of indigenous inhabitants of nagaland that is what we need to up ap government plans to launch cradle bell system so this cradle bell system is to protect the babies who are been left by the mothers it means infanticide is a major problem so the cradle bell system it creates the cradles across the railway stations bus stations etc any person who is going to leave the child can leave into that particular cradle so that is what is a new development and rti act on the brink of extinction so RTI acts biggest strength is the independence of the information commissioners the present amendment act is diluting the independence of the information commissioners and information commission is going to more behave as a department of the government so in this context without autonomy the RTI act will not have distinguished uh, power to the citizens so that's the reason why it has been stated that RTI acts amendment it is leading to the citizens oversight extinction on the governance these are the articles for today thank you very much have a great day all the best